Welcome to the More Than ADHD podcast, episode 11. And this is great. I need to actually start using more than two hands to count. So we've made it all the way into double digits. So yay us. We're bringing in one of the newest thought leaders and someone who I'm so excited to get to know, author and fellow neurodivergent and neurodivergent advocate, Alice Hewson. If this is your first time here, we're so excited that you're checking out the More Than ADHD podcast. And if you haven't already, make sure that you ring that bell, like this, and comment below. Share it with whoever you think needs to hear it, because the more that you engage with the show, whether it's on YouTube or any of the many streaming platforms, that's going to help us to increase the people that we can help and spread that awareness around the globe. Here's today's question of the day. Have you ever felt alone or alienated in the workplace? Because that was one of the things that I got from Alice's book that resonated with me on the deepest level. So please comment below to just let others know if they're feeling the same way, they're not alone. Here at Ryan Mayer Coaching, I coach other people like me with ADHD to take actionable steps towards their goals. And we want to help you to be able to close the gap between intention and action. Because many times, even if we know what to do, we struggle doing it. And I'm really here because I want to empower you to be able to step into your greatness. Make sure that you go to ADHDonline.com. Because like so many people out there, you might be thinking there's something about the way you're experiencing the world that's a little bit different from others. So maybe you have some sort of condition and you can check that out. You can go to ADHDonline.com, take the assessment that they have, which is one of the best on all of the internet. And you can use discount code coachryan 50 at checkout uh, to get $50 off of that assessment. Uh, I was just talking with one of our main representatives from ADHD online earlier this week, and they're just doing so many great things and helping thousands of people all around uh, to get a better grip on what's happening in their lives. At the top of the show, before we get into all of this great conversation I'm so excited for, I want to make sure that I self-describe in case you are listening to this on one of the podcast apps or if you may have any visual impairments. So uh, I am a Caucasian male um, wearing my ADHD empowered tan shirt and green hazel eyes and an enthusiastic smile. So that's me. So now we get to jump into the exciting part of the podcast. I've been a fan from afar of Alice because she lives in the UK and I'm so excited to tell everyone about her book, Neurodiversity in the Workplace, How to Create and it's like, I'm trying to read backwards, how to create an inclusive and safe environment. And first of all, just even by the title itself, there's a lot of books for those who are just listening. I have an entire bookshelf and the top shelf is all neurodiversity related um, books. And Alice is by far, and I'm not even, and I have such respect for all the authors, but by far just like touched my heart because I felt like she understood my experience and how hard it was. Um, before we get into Ryan's emotions, uh, I just want to give Alice the floor here to talk a little bit about what was your inspiration, Alice, of writing this book? Thank you very much for all your kind sort of things you've said about, um, yeah, my book. I, I also have a copy here. So my inspiration. I always wanted to, well, I've been a writer for years. I've written about neurodiversity um, on, a, on a blog for, for a long time. Um, and I've always been comfortable sharing my experiences online. Um, and sort of previously, I've al always had quite negative experiences in the workplace. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 32, um, so much later in life. Um, and then I started medication. and because I had the tools to understand a bit more about how my brain worked, 
um, I understood that there was more that I could do in terms of my career and I, I had the tools to be able to go to job interviews and talk about my experiences and be able to focus and sort of share why I could sort of um, I was a good candidate to work for um, a new organisation so I changed jobs um, still with the memories of quite negative workplace experiences but I've changed jobs um, and I met so my most recent employer um, were incredibly inclusive they were supportive my, my man line manager understood what I needed and sh she knew the right things to say I didn't have to ask for anything I felt safe I felt like I could be myself and then when I really realized that I could be myself at work and that I didn't have to hide my ADHD I didn't have dyspraxic too so I didn't have to hide my dyspraxia I could um I wanted to tell other people about it I thought well this is a world that I didn't know existed I always expected that I had to ask for things or ask a reasonable adjustment all the things um I didn't but then I went to this world where my line manager was lovely and she supported me and I was like I need other people to know about this I can't keep this to myself this can't be like my own secret like I want to write about it you know I just I felt like I found this thing I need to tell people that I was like this is what inclusion looks like and I was um in my 30s at this point and I was like why is it taking this long for me to understand and learn what inclusion should be like in the workplace I think because when we're at school especially like neurodivergent children we're taught about um I'm not entirely sure in terms of across in the states sort of um I guess accommodations over there for school kids but especially for me I had things like extra time and exams I was told to ask for things that had to go to a special room because I was identified as special needs at the time and it was all like you're different but it wasn't about how to feel included and that your brain could be an asset and um, to an, an organization an employer we weren't taught about the positives of having a neurodivergent brain and so when I started to learn about inclusion and what um what I could sort of I guess my brain could bring to a new organization to understand that I didn't have to ask for things all the time I didn't have this thing about systemic inclusion and universal design so I learned all about this so I wrote this book so actually at first I wrote a guide and I published that on my blog and it was just a pdf basic guide around inclusion in the workplace and how to be inclusive and then from then I wrote this book I was like well I need I felt inspired that I had to sort of share more of my story um and it was only I wanted it to be a positive book I wanted to have like positive constructive ideas nobody really wants to read about somebody's constant negative experiences and I was like at the stage where things got better and that's why I wanted to share my story then it was the right time to to talk about it um and yeah kind of yeah and um I had actually a funny story so I had the book started I had covid and I was really really bored because I've got ADHD and I was I was isolated in my room I was really bored I was like I just started writing this book when I had COVID I didn't write it all when I had COVID but that was the kind of catalyst for me to like sit down and like the sign of um guess I had I needed something to focus on and it's amazing too because I know for a lot of other content creators other coaches for example in the space many people have said that a lot of the services for people who are neurodivergent really grew in awareness and accessibility sort of out of uh, necessity. And it, it sounds like that also helped for you to be able to, it's like, well, hey, I can't, I have to be in lockdown. I can't go out and be around people. So I um, may as well be productive with the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think kind of having having that space and permission to do it as well I think I think we're, we're very busy people we've got lots of priorities lots of things to do and giving your giving yourself permission to just be and do that creative thing can be quite difficult when there's lots of other competing priorities and things like cats to feed and you know all, all the day-to-day -day things that we have to do as well um so yeah definitely having that having that permission that time to be creative um, really helped me. Well, I know that this is a broad statement, but I feel compelled to say it. Thank you on behalf of 
all of the neurodivergent, your neurodivergent friends out there around the world. Uh, thank you for trusting your instinct and having that, that kind of burning desire that you had to share this because I, I want to tell you, it brought me a lot of hope just reading through it, hearing about your positive experience, because this is just yet another reason why I related to you in such a deep way was I feel like in my content, I'm constantly shedding light on my darkest moments. And you talked a lot about, you know, when you were at your lowest and, when, you know, in these times where it was very lonely and isolating. So to hear the flip side of that, that there are people, there are these magical places called companies that actually want to embrace. And I wrote down, as you were saying, like you felt safe and you could be yourself. Like those are not audacious requests. This is just something that humans should have in the workplace. And so I'm so glad that you answered that call to, to share that. I, and I love the fact that you talked about universal design and the two examples. And I, I just have to show off that I actually read your book when you talked about universal design. But honestly, it was like literally page one or two. I'm like, whoa, this is such a big idea. I'm, I've never thought of it this way. Um, I'm going to have you explain universal design in a minute, but first these two examples, because I'm a very visual person. One is you talked about how an organization doesn't just build in England, you would call it a lift in America. We call it an elevator. Um, you wouldn't build an elevator or a lift after you hire someone who's in a wheelchair, a, an elevator or a lift. Those are going to benefit everyone. Um, and then the other example you gave that I thought was brilliant was when you go to a restaurant, you don't expect that you're going to go in and say, uh, can I have a chair, please? Or can I have a table and uh, utensils to use when I eat? It's like, wait, no, that's already there so that everyone is equipped to enjoy their experience. But yet our work environment is far from that. So maybe you can comment on that a little. Definitely. So those two examples, because I'm very visual as well. And I knew, you know, I just felt that having everybody go, most people sort of go out for meals and restaurants, they can all relate to that. And everybody's obviously used a lift. Not everybody who uses lifts are wheelchair users as well, which is why, which, which, which is kind of what came. And I think that I, people have different in terms of neurodivergence or disability or whatever name sort of terminology you're comfortable with. Things that you can't necessarily see that aren't physical, people seem to often have a different idea around adjustments and accessibility and design of workplaces. And so universal design to me is, yeah, like I've said, having a lift always there, going out for a meal and not having to ask for a chair when you make your reservation. And it's about being able to sit there comfortably with the rest of the team and participate in a way that suits your brain best, but also support the productivity of the company. But in terms of like um, neurodivergence, you can design, it doesn't have to be about physical design of the workplace as well. We can talk about, you can have quiet spaces and that could be built into your workplace. Um, there's lots of software that you could just have on your computer that some people might find really beneficial and some people not so much, but they don't have to come to their manager and disclose, yeah, I need this, it's just there, they need to use it. That's so excellent. And I, like you said, it doesn't have to be something that breaks the bank because it could just be something as easy as printing out the questions or if it's a virtual interview, putting it in the chat. It's funny because that's one of these things like I've never heard of that before, but yet that's so simple and it makes so much sense. And so you would think that this could be something universally applied. Oh, Hence, universal design. Can you just describe, if you're comfortable with it, what dyspraxia yeah, is? Yeah, no, dyspraxia, or it sometimes is called developmental co coordination disorder. And I have a feeling that that diagnosis will be used more in the US. I would just describe this as dyspraxia. It's more, I think, developmental co coordination disorder is more of a medicalized terminology. Dyspraxia is essentially, um, it affects gross and fine motor coordination skills processing information, um, organization of thought. So there's a lot, but there's a lot of overlaps of ADHD, but in terms of dyspraxia about the coordination, so things that might be difficult, driving a car, for example, 
in terms of coordination um spatial awareness i think that's why one of the reasons why i wasn't diagnosed with adhd for so long because everything i put down to my dyspraxia i was like well i've got this diagnosis this must be everything but then i realized that it was the medication that really helped my brain and I and that's what i think is so valuable for the kind of work that you and i are doing as advocates uh, for neurodiversity neurodivergent folks like us uh, because i think that's something that organizations should think more about like if hey google map developers um you need to help out those of us that are not so good with spatial awareness and directions because as you're talking i'm like wait a minute do i have some aspects of dyspraxia because directions are not my strong suit at all um but it so it makes sense but i think the more we can talk about it and the more we can share uh you know it'll help to drive change i can understand why because i know with our partners at adhd online they often talk about you know there's such a stigma associated with adhd uh, but it shouldn't have to stop you from living your best life uh, and i think you've done a great job of that and and for anyone who is listening to it if this is really resonating with you not only is there going to be a lot of information about the work that Alice does in the show notes, we'll also have a link to ADHD online. And, you know, we just all really feel nobody should have to go through the, this process alone of living with this condition and wondering, is it just me? Because everybody should have a place to go where they can get care and treatment. So if you haven't already, make sure uh, you check out ADHDonline.com and then you can have, put in code uh, Coach Ryan50 for $50 off uh, the services. So big thanks to ADHD Online. And by the way, thanks for getting comfortable shirts. These fit great and they're, they're comfy, which for those of us, uh, our sensory input is very important. So thank you for that. Um, well, Alice, I want to make sure to ask a little bit about what advice would you give to a neurodivergent individual who might be struggling to find workplaces that align with their strengths and their needs? Because I know you said that you had done enough research and you felt comfortable disclosing during your interview, which is amazing. But do you have any advice for someone who is not quite sure what to do? Well, I haven't always disclosed in interviews. So that was that was really the first time I think I did disclose. Um, prior to that, when I was much younger, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody I think it's difficult. I think everybody, everybody's got their own strengths, and I don't like the word weaknesses, but maybe challenges and things they might find a bit more difficult to do. And everybody's got their interests and what they're good at. I think for me, in terms of finding finding a career, was really difficult. So I, I went to university um, when I was eighteen, like everybody else, because that's what my school said you have to do. You have to go and get a degree. So I went off and got a degree. In hindsight. I could have probably done within a year or two just to work out who I was. This is sort of when I was undiagnosed ADHD as well. So I didn't really have full picture, but I think there's a lot of pressure on young people to go and, go and find that career. Um, that was difficult. Sort of moving on, I, I, I worked in youth work. Um, so I, I did a master's in youth, youth um, and community work and worked with young people, um, which eventually led on to working sort of my sort of career path now has led into kind of charity communications and and writing because that's what I realized I was really good at I was I was good at writing um even prior to sort of publishing this book and I think really just think about your what you enjoy and every and I think that's really difficult because I know some people they in terms of job they have to go you have to go out to work to pay get pay the bills and that's what you have to do to survive um, so I think it is challenging, but I think about what you enjoy and what you can offer a company, an organisation and have a look at their website and look at what their values are. So what I do is I I look for a real alignment with inclusion and equity and diversity. And most companies, depending on what sector you are, most companies will have a page on their website around that. And I think that gives you a really good indication of if are these people that I want to work for. I watch lots of YouTube videos if I've got social media. I just kind of, I really research the company. I really research yes. them. I want to know all about them before I apply. There is rights and there is um, responsibilities of employers to ensure that 
disabled people or neurodivergent people are included in the workplace, but that doesn't always translate to practice. Um, as we know, as we know, because there wouldn't be so many stories of negative experiences. I think, especially with stigma, I think, especially with ADHD, it's more well known than dyspraxia, but people don't really understand ADHD. There's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of misconceptions around ADHD and, and medication as well. Um, <laughs> and I think, and I, especially as like a woman, someone who identifies as a woman as well, there's lots of sort of ADHD has been misdiagnosed for years in women and girls because it's seen as like this sort of the hyperactive boy running around the classroom. And I would never, I don't look like a hyperactive eight year old boy. So you can't have ADHD. You can't, you know, and that's the kind of assumptions that are medical professionals as well. And it's that's really ingrained and that, that has translated to workplace as well. So um, I think even with ADHD, people know the name, but they don't really understand. And that's where the challenge is in the workplace of kind of. I totally agree from, with I that. Think. I'm actually really glad to hear you say that, Alice, because the same thing is happening here in the United States. In fact, just a couple of episodes ago here on the podcast, we covered some of the most common myths around ADHD. And you it sounds like you're reading from the script because it's spot on that people uh, don't realize, especially when it's a non-apparent disability. And if the hyperactivity is happening inside, uh, people don't know that. Um, so it's just so important for us to be able to find places that are more inclusive. And speaking of that, I know we were doing some research on your website, and I saw that you advocate for a paradigm shift, shifting it from the neurodivergent employee asking for things and putting the responsibility onto the employer. And that was so powerful because I totally agree with that. You know, what are ways that companies can do that? Because I think that is really what's going to help to accelerate these changes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think, I think learning is a big thing. I think companies, I think it's really difficult. Lived experience shouldn't be, I really, I'm sort of sure I talk about a lot about my lived experience, but that is my choice. But I feel that in, in companies and organizations, you will have there will be neurodivergent people in every single company or organization around the world because we're everywhere. There are lots of us, there's many of us. Um, neurodivergent people, we can um, feel included and supported and safe at work um, and have, have something and be committed to it. Don't have an inclusion page on your website, but then do nothing more for inclusion. Don't say stuff, but not do it. And I think your actions speak louder than words. That's sort of that cliche, you know, you, you have to be physically doing something. And, you know, if you have an inclusion page in your website, great, but show people what you're doing. I've been to many interviews when um, there has been, sort of, they talked about inclusion and diversity. I thought, oh, great, this is a great place to work. I get the interview. And then there's a lot of things that they're doing that aren't inclusive. And that will be, be well, this will make sense because they haven't thought about it. They haven't thought deeply about inclusion. I think that's really important. Think deeply about what inclusion means. These are all such great things. And just from one neurodivergent person to another, Alice, I just want to say it's so amazing. Like you wrote a book. This is incredible. So I'm so glad that you did. And I want to share something with you that occurred to me, uh, over the last week or so, as I was reading your book, out of anything I've listened to or read, I wanted to tell you that a couple of these pages, which I'm going to read a little excerpt, uh, they were the most validating three or four pages that I've ever read. And I don't use that lightly. I've never said that to anyone, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm so grateful for you and for what you're doing and how much that hit me. And I'm all the way around the world, uh, you know, across the ocean from you. So I know that this is going to have and impact. And uh, for those who are listening, I want to just read a little excerpt. And I know this is a little bit longer episode, but guess what? This is the reason why Alice and I do the work that we do. So I want organizational leaders to hear this. I want people who might feel like they're alone in a really dark place or a low place emotionally. I want you to hear this because 
right here you can see I have all these, uh, I showed the pages of the book and I, I didn't just underline things like I usually do. I just circled whole pages because here's what it says, because this example just rocked my world. So many of us have experienced bullying, uh, not only in the workplace, but when we were younger. And Alice did a really great job right here. So yes, I experienced this bullying as a young person. This is on page 90 of your book. If you'd like to follow along at home, um, I, I experienced this as a young person, not that it was always dealt with appropriately, but at least I could talk about it. And it was also impartial. But the bully's mother wasn't handling the disciplinary meeting at school or holding the mediation I went to. And I started going, oh, my goodness, I think she's on something. Imagine this. So you've just been through a horrendous and isolating experience that is bullying. And when, you know, this is the thing when you're younger and when the meetings finally arranged to deal with it, you head into school to find the bully's mother sitting there ready to kick off the proceedings. Like, of course, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't be fair. That would be very one sided and judgmental. There'd be a bias there. Well, if it did, the mom would surely try everything in her power to protect little Johnny, the bully. No detentions this time around. It may not literally be the bully's mom, but holding the grievance meetings at work, but I'm sure you get my point. Grievance procedures are often handled internally by the organizations. So in, in essence, the CEO or senior leadership, they're investigating themselves. So therefore, just like the bully's mom in the school example, they don't want to be found out to be wrong. They don't want to hear that their kids are the ones that are the problem or, you know, the, their managers. Um, they want to protect their organization's reputation, themselves, and their jobs. What support do we get as an adult to deal with a toxic work environment, especially when we enter the workplace and expect that bullying only happens to kids? Following discussion with others, it seems like we can't expect a lot in this current climate, at least. Most people are unable to talk for fear of losing their jobs and damaging their professional reputations. And Alice, like, I know you and I are just meeting, but you'll learn as I hope we stay connected and get to help each other. Um, and just that line right there, like I've been fired several times and it was only after I disclosed and felt like there was then a target on my back. Um, and you talked about it right here. And this is so important. I know we're going a little long. Thank you for hanging for a minute with us, everyone who's listening or watching. So Alice then says this, a few years ago, I was in a toxic work situation that led me to following the organization's grievance procedure. I was told over email with no warning that my employer didn't need me anymore for that work and that they had implied, employed some highly skilled staff. In other words, just implying that Alice wasn't highly skilled enough. And this was after she had been subjected to workplace bullying for months and discriminated against before she put in the grievance. I'm getting all fired up just reading this. Experience of the procedure that followed, which was not pleasant. And this is the part that really got me. I put like tears on the page. This workplace and the experience of the grievance procedure that followed, which was not a pleasant one, destroyed years of carefully built up self-esteem. I went from a fairly happy and bouncy Alice as a young professional who thought she was on the cusp of finally feeling sorted out to someone who felt utterly broken. And wow, there it is. And I wrote on top of the page, Alice, thank you for helping me feel seen. I started experiencing chest pains, a common anxiety system, but something I had never experienced previously with my anxiety. As you can imagine, the first time it happened, I thought I was dying. So I constantly held my wrist to make sure I could still feel a pulse. Isn't anxiety logic great? I, I laughed at that part. Um, this is something that I'm still dealing with years later. I had sleep problems and all these things. I'm like, yep, that's me. That's me. That's me. I stopped seeing friends. I found myself feeling tearful at the most inconvenient or bizarre times. I was eventually prescribed beta blockers to help me get through meetings and prevent things from jeopardizing other, the other work that I did. And here's the part where I'm circling all these words. I felt alone dealing with this and quickly came to realize that the grievance procedures are one-sided. And, and this is happening in America too. I can tell you, cause I've gone through the same stuff. Um, and many are there to protect a workplace's toxic culture, protect a workplace's toxic culture. Yes, that's exactly right. 
They focus on looking after the organization and protecting people's jobs. Checking in to see on how I was doing, that didn't exist. I felt increasingly alienated during the process as if I had done something wrong by speaking up. I felt so alone. Man, I want to get like a tattoo of these pages on my back. Um, <laughs> is it just me who's going through this? I, I she, So Alice went through the internet and, and found out other people are going through this. And it doesn't just happen on the playground 20 years ago. There's a stigma surrounding adults experiencing bullying and we're forced into this strange silence. Wow. Speaking right to my heart. Um, okay. Ba, 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 ba. Um, yeah. So anyway, there's, there's a couple more pages, but it's just so good. Um, so I just had to read that little excerpt because I hope people out there can hear this and know they're not alone. Yeah. And sort of those negative experiences were a catalyst to, and that kind of once I've experienced something more positive, which the book does go on. Um, to sort of talk about my more positive experiences and advice, advice for employers and managers as well. Um, that is all, it's all helped and it's shaped how I see inclusion now because I'm looking back at things and like, well, that shouldn't have been right. They shouldn't have done that. And there's lots of things now that are questioned. As I like to say, and we like to say at Ryan Mayer Coaching, uh, we're all in this thing together and we're committed to helping all of you find answers to the questions that you have because trust me other people are asking them too we like alice myself and the people also at adhd online like they want to help you live your best life with whatever your neurodivergent condition might be um so if if this is hitting home for you as much as it is for me uh, we're going to talk about where to find alice here in a minute but i also want to encourage you to check out adhd online we've had now dozens of people who have gone there and used the discount code Coach Ryan five zero for fifty dollars off, and people are having these big aha moments, realizing they're not alone anymore. So it's really incredible. But anyway, Alice, just to wrap things up, thank you again so much for your time. And um, I know that there's going to be people that listen or watch and are gonna want to know more about Alice. So where can they find out more about you? So my website, I'm on all of the social media, um, but my website to start off with is alicehewson.com and I'll spell out my second name because um, obviously it will be in the show notes, but just for people um, who, who need it spelled out. So my second name is H-E-W-S-O-N. Um, so that's alicehewson.com. I'm on Twitter um, as very strange Twitter handle, but it's Alice Rose, but with a four instead of an A. <laughs> I'm on I'm on LinkedIn as Alice Houston. If you sh if you Google me, I should I should appear um pop up as well. Um, and I'm on Instagram as well. So I'm, I can you can find me in all of the social media. Just to wrap it all up with a bow, um, is there anything else, Alice, that you would say just for anyone else who's listening, who might be in that place, in that low place that you and I have both experienced. Um, anything that you want to say to them? I feel that things can get better. I've seen them get better. I was in a place where I believed that um, things, were, or I was always, like I said before, I was always going to have to ask for things, or I was always going to have to ask for reasonable adjustments, or I was always going to feel different or that I didn't fit in. And I believe that was my, my, I guess, what, that was going to be my whole being. That wasn't, and that was my identity, but it shouldn't have been, it wasn't. And there are places where you can feel that valued, you can feel safe, you can have a line manager who really does support you. And my line manager has been fantastic. And she was she was the reason I kind of wrote this book because like, you're doing all the things. I'm, I'm, you're doing things I don't even have to ask you to do things, you do them. Because she's just, just a genuinely lovely, caring, supportive person. And yeah, so things can change and there are, are workplaces out there. And I think if we all talk about inclusion more, we connect as a community but with also people who aren't neurodivergent and they can um be our allies as well please don't put you in a position where you're gonna make yourself feel unsafe i think it's really important to be in a good place to be able to advocate um for yourself and other people as well that's really important to say well thank you for that and for any of you who uh, might be looking for some additional support or coaching services uh, you can go to my website, ryanmayercoaching.com. You can book a call. It's free. You can also join our digital community uh, that has several hundred members. That is a very safe space for you. 
Um, and we are just, I just want you to know that you're not alone, you're not broken. And to echo Alice's sentiments, your performance at work doesn't define your worth as a person. So just please know that you're an amazing person no matter what, and that I love you and you are amazing.